So after months and months of build-up and hype and anticipation, the moment finally came Friday, October 4th, 2019. SmackDown makes its debut on Fox Network Television. And for a guy like Vince McMahon, who for so many decades of his life has desperately, sometimes almost pathetically, sought out mainstream acceptance, here, here is your validation of all of those decades of effort and pandering. You've got one of your weekly television shows, two hours, prime time, Friday night on Fox. There you go. So you got it. Frankly, if I was Vince, I might have, when I came out with my daughter, spent five or ten minutes kind of basking in the glory and gloating about the fact, but that's just me. Nonetheless, after all this build-up and anticipation, you had the feeling that WWE was going to pull out at least a lot of the stops here, if not all the stops, to try and make big things happen, because you only have one chance to make a first impression. And here was a clear-cut chance, because you're on a new network, to really kind of reset everything. And in some ways, I feel like the WWE definitely delivered with that, and in other ways, it's like, eh, I don't know about all this. You look at the opening segment, and here comes Becky Lynch. And then after a couple of minutes, here comes Baron Corbin. And when Becky Lynch came out, I'm thinking to myself the whole time, you, you can't be this stupid. You're going to go into your brand new show and the first thing, first impression you're going to give is Becky Lynch and then Baron Corbin? No, no, no. The Rock's got to be coming out. The Rock's got to be coming out. You've been pumping this up and promoting this and hyping this up. He's got to be coming out. And thank God he did. And when he came out, it was just a reminder of what professional wrestling should be. It was a reminder of what a megastar looks like. And it was also, unfortunately, a reminder of just how lacking the current wrestlers, even the top wrestlers in WWE, are by comparison. Becky Lynch, I will at least say, while still a little awkward kind of being there in the position with the rock of all people, not nearly as cringy if it was Seth Rollins in that spot, let's be honest. But the opening promo segment, it goes 15, 20 minutes, but it involves the rock, so you can get away with that. And people feel like they got their money's worth. And they feel like, man, that was awesome. That was just damn fun. And that's what professional wrestling is supposed to be, is fun. And that was a lot of it. So now, this opening segment, you've got the crowd energized. They are engaged. They're eating out of the palm of your hands. They're living it up. I'm living it up. And then you smack us in the face with the reality and follow it up with a women's tag match. And it's just a reminder of what wrestling was and should be versus what wrestling is today. Now, the whole point of this was so Charlotte could tap out Bailey to build up to their match Sunday at Hell in a Cell. I'm good with that. We didn't really need that here. Because let's be honest, as of now, they've announced four matches for Hell in a Cell. Why should anybody care if you don't care? It's a fair question. But... It's just, again, it was striking. You know, back in Rock's time, in the peak of his career, you had sexy women and they were doing provocative things. And ironically enough, way more over as draws and as talents than the ladies of today, where it's primarily geared around their in-ring abilities. Again, a perfect example of it's more important to be a personality, more important to be a character, more important to tell stories than it is to be able to do some damn moves in the ring. But nonetheless, I digress. Then it goes into Seth Rollins and Shinsuke Nakamura, and the whole time I'm just sitting there waiting for the Fiend. I said, just give me the Fiend. I will make this worth it. And what's weird about it to me is when it finally happened, where Shinsuke's in the ring as the lights go down and the music hits, and doing what you would think he should be doing, here's Seth Rollins cowering and playing chicken shit up the ramp. You know, one trait that people like is courage, even if it's foolhardy, but especially Americans. One trait that Americans really like is courage. One trait they really, really hate is cowardice. You're trying to position this guy, Seth Rollins, as your top dude, forcing him down our freaking throats, no matter how uncool and un how unworthy he is of that spot, and that has been proven. Instead of having him stand in the ring and face down the fiend and not be afraid and be like, you know what? He's a badass. 
he's not scared, even though he knew he was probably going to get his ass whooped. You have him cower away up the ramp like a damn coward, and then you wonder why nobody gets interested, nobody gets engaged in the character, why Seth Rollins isn't really that over, even as the top guy, you continue to pound and force down everybody's throats. Well, it's bullshit like this. At least you can say out of it, you get The Fiend, and The Fiend is one of the most unique things you have on your product today, and we could definitely use a little bit of unique in today's wrestling, that's for damn sure. Now then when you get to the mid-show one-hour main event, it was the ladder match with Shane McMahon and Kevin Owens. And this thing was intense, it was heavy hitting, <laughs> excuse me, it was hard hitting. You felt like this was a big deal. You felt like, frankly, this was a match that deserved a little more in terms of build up, in terms of talking about it, in terms of promoting it. And instead, it just kind of fell in the middle of the show. And if it was going to do that, at least put it after the opening segment. Because I felt like that would have been a much better way to really keep and maintain the energy of the crowd and trying to send that message and reset things and say, hey, you know, you tune in. This might be the type of match that you're going to be able to see sometimes. Because the match itself, in terms of pure entertainment value, was really, really good. Of course Shane McMahon is going to go out there and kill himself. Kevin Owens is going to go out there and kill himself. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I'm coming out with a cold. And, and if you're not really going to build up to it throughout the night, then at least put it on there in the second segment. Because, man, then that first 30 to 40 minutes of the show is going to be absolutely outstanding. Instead, it felt like it was kind of just put there in the middle of the show. It just kind of happened. And... It didn't have nearly the drama effect or consequences that it potentially should have. And when you look at this, you know, that was kind of disappointing. Um, really, really good match, but in some ways it just felt like these guys were trying to rush and get everything in instead of slowing down a little bit and being able to tell a true story. That was the only complaint I had about it. Otherwise, other than that, it was really, really good. You know, it was something that you're going into a new network, you're trying to establish these are the types of things you could potentially see. It makes sense. Then you get to the Braun Strowman stuff and, excuse me, new network, different night, same old result. <laughs> Fucked off Ziggler! At least he got jobbed out with one of those squash mash finishes from the 90s. That was freaking glorious. But all this stuff with Braun Strowman and Tyson Fury, you know what? I'm cool with it. You're trying to get some mainstream exposure. You're trying to get some mainstream viability, some mainstream credibility. Here you go. Heavyweight boxing champion versus one of your biggest and baddest ass dudes. I thought it really, really worked. I wish they would have let them actually kind of go at it a little bit, but I'm okay with them keeping them apart for the time being. Now, as I'm sitting there and thinking about it, I'm like, initially, oh, man, this is cool. Maybe they're building up to something at Survivor Series. Maybe they'll have a moment at the Royal Rumble. Maybe this will be the build-up for Braun's gimmick match at WrestleMania. And then I realized, got to get that Saudi money. And as a result, this shit's probably going to be blown off at freaking Crown Jewel or whatever the hell show it's going to be in Saudi Arabia. And it's going to be... <laughs> which, again, is kind of a common theme. Instead of building up to your pay-per-view, which is two days away, seemed like a good idea, or try and plant the seed for your biggest show of the year. Gotta get that Saudi money! Woo! That's funky. And that, that's basically what this whole shit was. <sighs> Aggravating. Now, in terms of the presentation of this show, I really, really liked it. It did have a sport-like type of feel. I like how when a Braun Strowman was walking down, you know, you're emphasizing he's six foot four, 380 pounds. You're giving a little background and bio. Like, that's the type of stuff you would see with the real sport. So that worked for me. Um, the camera work, I thought, was relatively crisp by comparison to what you would usually see with the Kevin Dunn produced show. Again, I like that very much. Um, it just had a big atmosphere to it, and I really, really enjoyed that. And I hope that is something they're able to maintain, although understanding that they threw a lot at this damn show to try and get it off the ground and try and get it over. Which then brings us to the main event. We spent weeks building up to this. Brock Lesnar challenging Kofi Kingston for the WWE Championship. What more can be said about this? A lot of people are pissed off because they feel like Kofi deserved better and he shouldn't have been jobbed out and bitched out like this and squashed 
in freaking what it was, eight seconds. And you know what? I tend to agree. There are a lot of different ways you could have went with this. And I felt like the WWE went down the worst possible path. And the biggest problem to me with this is that the WWE can no longer talk, tell layered, multifaceted stories. It's like they unnecessarily have to close off one chapter in order to begin writing the next one. To me, the much more effective thing to have done was Rey Mysterio bringing in Cain Velasquez could make a ton of sense. And we'll talk about that in a second. But if you really want the issue between Brock and Kane to take on some type of relevant wrestling feel, then why not have Kane Velasquez cost Brock Lesnar his chance at the WWE Championship? Just as you're getting ready to get into the match or even let Brock, five, Brock hit that initial F5 on Kofi Kingston and get ready to pin. And all of a sudden, here's Rey Mysterio's music. And up comes Brock Lesnar wondering what the hell's going on. And all of a sudden, he sees freaking Cain Velasquez. And then you have Kofi do some type of roll-up finish. One, two, three, get the fuck out of there. Or you don't even have the damn finish because Brock is so consumed by what's going on. Maybe he even beats the shit out of Kofi for a little bit and he gets DQ'd due to unnecessary roughness. Whatever the hell it takes my day. But you had this guy be a champion for six months, and his title reign was mediocre, to be fair. And to me, it was all about the moment at WrestleMania. And he got, we got that, and that's never going to be taken away from us. And I'll probably talk about it in another video, because I don't want to bog down this review. I can understand and see why people are upset about this. Because it, it is honestly disappointing. I'm more disappointed about it, not with any racial component in this case, which you might be surprised, coming from me. I'm not so disappointed about it because it's Brock doing it in the da, 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 da. You know, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. It's just fake fighting. Well, what bothers me is that they could have gotten way more mileage out of it. And instead of just pumping up UFC shit, mixed martial arts shit, and non-WWE stuff, you could have immediately put a real life, real wrestling relevant example into the story. And they dropped the ball on that, and they failed on that, and I'm not surprised. Now, as far as Kane coming out, you know, when you talk about the problem of Brock Lesnar not having legitimate, legitimate, credible opponents, apparently, unless her name is fucking Seth Rollins, here's a guy in Kane Velasquez that beat the fuck out of him years ago in MMA. So he instantly is believable, even if it's not truly in a wrestling sense, and that's something. Now, you might sit there and say, you're here in WWE and you're building up to two MMA guys ultimately. And I kind of get that as well. But shit, you need something. And if this was going to be what you did for Survivor Series, you're going to build up to this as a Royal Rumble or especially WrestleMania, then I'm all down for it. Personally, I don't think this feud needed the damn belt. It should be more about a personal issue than a damn title, but that's what the hell we're going to go with. But then I remember... Now they got that fucking Saudi show coming up soon, and surely they're going to throw this fucking crap at it. Gotta get that Saudi money. The hell with the hell in a cell on Sunday. The hell with your pay-per-view business in the next few months. We're going to fucking blow our load because we want to get the Saudi oil money. It's just aggravating from a fan's perspective. Perhaps understandable from a business perspective, but maybe not. But Cain Velasquez, all these people talk about, well, he didn't look great. He's never been a body guy anyways. If you can't understand that the guy that legitimately kicked Brock's ass years back in MMA is a legit threat to him, then I don't know what the hell to tell you. I thought it was relatively well done. It came across big lead. Contrary to what people are saying, it did get a reaction. Go back and watch and listen. At least I will say, if anything else, with this show. I like the feel and the presentation of it. I feel like the WWE cared, whereas so often they don't. And they gave us some memorable things. With so many Raws and SmackDowns we have now, we don't get memorable things. Here, we got multiple memorable things. The Rock. The Owens ladder match and Shane McMahon getting fired. The Fiend choking out Seth Rollins' cowardly bitch ass. Braun Strowman and Tyson Fury. Kane Velasquez debuting. My God, it's gotta be! It's gotta be! It's gotta be Kane! We're not gonna get this every week. 
But at least for one week, damn it, I'm going to enjoy this. I will rant and rave and bitch about the Kofi thing, perhaps in a different video. But for now, I'm going to enjoy it. Because for so long, I've been waiting for this company to actually act like they give a crap. Well, here, they give a crap. And you might be fussing about, oh, they're putting over boxing and they're putting over UFC. Well, no fucking shit, Sherlock. It's what they did years back bringing in Ken Shamrock. And it's what they did years back bringing in Mike Tyson and Floyd Money Mayweather. That's what you do. You bring in guys from other platforms to draw new eyeballs. You bring in other mainstream talents to try and get more eyeballs. This is a fucking business. And at least for one week, Vince McMahon, SmackDown, did good business. Pfft, hell with your pay-per-view on Sunday, of course, but it was something. So feel free to let me know what you thought of the premiere of SmackDown on Fox. For my money, even though I had elements and moments where I was reminded of the crap that we get now, there were enough other surprising, shocking, and interesting things that that two hours on Friday night went like that.